I just learned that, you know, the more you broaden your horizons, you know, the cooler person you'd be. Mm -hmm. So I've had all these influences with music, and I just decided, you know, let me lean toward this rap music, let me try to do it. But I could only draw from my experiences, and since I had been living this kind of underworld experience, right. I just said, hey, I'm just going to sing about what I know. Let's talk about where you came from. I mean, you are the original, you're OG, that term comes from <laughs> me. From you. Uh -huh. You are the most respected uh, guy in, in the rap world, and then you became an actor. And, but, but you and I have this thing. We're both from the street. We both were from another place. And Nightclub want, entertainers. Yeah, up all night. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, being in a world where there's, you know, I was around mob guys, you were on your version of that. Mm -hmm. Outsiders. Shady individuals. Shady mm -hmm. individuals. And then now we're on this hit TV show, and there's, you know, and we have this other persona. And we're cops. And we're cops. The irony of that. <laughs> I mean, some of my friends look at me to this day, and they, you know. But, but you know what it is, Bells? I think, I think when you come from that other side, and you really know the, the penalties and, and the chances you took, mm -hmm. and then you finally get a chance to be legit, if you don't mm -hmm. take that, you're, you're foolish. Right. You know, I mean, maybe somebody that doesn't really even know what the streets are like, maybe they want to go risk it over there. But when you're fortunate enough to live through it, right. and, and you're a survivor... You had no choice. Well, I'll say 80% of my real friends are doing life in prison. Mm -hmm. So I already know or the option. Dead or, or dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the other 20%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a long time ago, mm -hmm. we're going to go back now, uh, you were in a, a car accident, mm -hmm. and you were in the hospital for... 10 weeks. 10 weeks. You told me that nobody came to visit you. Yeah. And it was, you had an epiphany about yourself. You yeah. realized, wait a minute, I may not be the greatest person in the world. Well, you know what it, it is? What like, happened in that time? Like, even though you, you, you made it, Right. Theoretically, you, you could have really been dead right then. Right. Let's see, so you, you look at your life like that, like, wow, that was my whole life, right there. It could have been. It could have been my whole life. And I haven't done anything. Ah, so in the hospital, you're saying to yourself, okay, I could have been dead. What have I accomplished? Let's look at my whole life. Right. You've been selfish. You've been out here trying to get everything for yourself. You think you're known, but you're really known for what you have. You haven't done anything. And you just change. You just say, you know, I don't want to be this guy. And of course, you yeah, had 10 weeks in the hospital. Maybe two people came to see me. Right. And I realized that. When you're that kind of person, when you disappear, people are like, well, I'm happy he's gone. Yeah. You know? And I didn't want to be like that. So when you came out of the hospital, mm -hmm. what, what were the first things that you did? What did you start doing? You know, the music was already starting on a small level, but I was forced into that lane also because the types of crimes I used to commit were very physical. And I couldn't run. So even if I had a came out of there and said, you know what, I'm gonna go back, it's kind of like whatever is above us, God or whatever said, we're gonna make it so you're, you, you have just to, can't do it. Yeah, that's so interesting. You can't do it. And in that period of time of recovery, that's when I started to get yeah. more into the music. I had time to be alone. And that's why a lot of times, sometimes if you go to jail, you get yourself together. Yeah, it's one or the other. Sometimes you gotta get stopped. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's so fascinating. <laughs> no, really, because it was like fate, or whatever you want to call it, it imposed this physical restriction on you, mm -hmm. so it made you go inside yourself, mm -hmm. and, and you had to do something else. Mm -hmm. And the first song? Well, first songs I were like freestyle rhymes I would do in the clubs just to get my friends hyped up. But my biggest initial record was a record called Six in the Morning, mm -hmm. which was a song about cops coming and get you at six in the morning, police at my door, mm -hmm. fresh Adidas squeaked across the bathroom floor, out my back window, I made my escape, didn't even get a chance to grab my old school tape. So it's a, a and, the, and the whole song is about a guy on the run and mm -hmm. going out on the street and meeting with his friends and right. going to jail. And uh, it hit. And I was like, that hit? And that was a record I kind of did for my friends. And you, you said that you were surprised because it was like a personal kind of... Yeah. And then you realized there was a wider appeal to it. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And once I understood that, I just started to make more music, and I, I found that I didn't really have to chase any trends. I could just make whatever was coming out of my yeah, body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like a, a great moment. It's kind of like even when I started acting, I would go on the set and they go, 
read the line and say, open the door. I go, open the door, and the director goes, incredible. Ah. I'm, like, I'm like, yo, this is great. <laughs> so I, I'm like one of those people that have had a career just totally being myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I can attest to that. I think it's just there's a shortage on honesty. This is a really good point because we were talking about this the other day in, in, your, in your dressing room, I think, mm -hmm. or on the set, about how there, there are people that are doing music or singing about stuff they never experienced. Mm -hmm. People will tend to believe the fake before the real. It's just how it the, is. When the early stuff came mm -hmm. out, the, the people that were doing it were real. Well, yes, absolutely. It was like the real shit. Because it wasn't already a, a blueprint to do it. To, yeah, like there, it was like... You're taking a risk doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. You discovered that what you felt and what you thought was true worked, and you were like, wow, okay. It's like when Lenny Bruce did comedy, he was just doing it. Right. Then when everyone else came and tried to emulate it. Yeah, we're standing on his shoulders, right. The thing is, is that you're an educator. I mean, I love that you, you did this thing once where you went to a uh, predominantly, it was a private school. Right. And you taught these kids how to rap. Yeah. And there was one scene in there where you were talking to the kids, and you would ask them about their life and what they knew. And it, it, I mean, it made me cry. Remember that girl who talked yeah. about abuse and, the, you know, and then that by the end of the series, you know, they, were, they had a walk and an yeah. attitude. Yeah, I had one cute little girl, I said, I'm going to take you to the Bronx. He says, I'll be raped and killed. You know, she's from the Upper East Side. Right. I'm like, who told you that? Yeah, you had to change perception. Right. Yeah, right. Who told you Who that? told you you'd be raped and killed in the Bronx? Some of her parents or somebody, somebody had told did. her. Right. And um, I took her to the Bronx. She didn't get raped and killed. Then we came back, I asked her. I said, what did you see in the Bronx? She said, I see, I've never seen so many people hug each other. Wow. Because you know, in the hood, everybody hugs. Yeah. They don't do that on the Upper East Side. Right. They shake your hand like yeah. this. Yeah, distance. In the ghetto, everybody, right. we embrace. Connect. Yeah, and she came back. She had a whole different That's what thing. she said. i never seen so many people hug Isn't each other. is amazing? Coco, you have your own show. Ice Loves Coco. Ice Loves Coco, mm -hmm. which is kind of vaguely based on I Love Lucy, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Right? He would be the husband, you know, right. since I've got the hair Ricky, brain. Ricky, Lou. I've got right. the hair brain ideas. <laughs> you know. It's natural. It's, it's natural. Like, no, they don't have to write. You and Coco have this chemistry and history together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, it's like a whole different world. But let's talk about Cop Killer, which was totally misunderstood, in my view. I mean, this was a lead story on the news. Quails, the president, it was, you know, a rapper. You know, it's like, take us through that period where you wrote this song, which essentially, from my view, was about, not about go out and kill cops, but about being in a situation where you might, you might have to kill a cop because they're coming in and you weren't advocating it. Well, what it is is, like, starts like this. First off, when the press got it, they called it a rap record, which it wasn't. It was done by my rock band. Mm -hmm. So that was almost like a racial maneuver right there because when you say rap, ah, they say black them, them niggas. Yeah, you dig? I'm here. That's that's rap. Right. But if you say rock, it could be Fleetwood Mac. Uh -huh. I don't know. Maybe I, I might like it. Rock song. But uh, I was in my rehearsal hall. And, no, my drummer was there, and I walked in singing "Psycho Killer" by Talking Heads. I was like "Psycho Killer." Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm like that. And he goes, and he's tuning the drums. He's like, "Man, we need a cop killer." I'm like, why? And he says, yo, you know, they just shot such and such over there and they killed my man's wife with the baby in her and, you know, cops are crazy right now. This is pre-Rogney King. Right. Yeah, he says, man, they out of hand right now. So that started me to think and I was like, what if somebody just went off the edge like a serial killer was triggered by police brutality? Ah. What if some dude went on a, you know, on a mission? So I kind of created like a Henry the serial killer. Right created this guy who, you know, because in the, in the hook to the record is cop killer, it's better you than me. Cop killer, fuck police brutality. Right. People miss that part of well, it. Well, they, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna take what they want. They created it. this guy. Yeah, this guy That's is- That's the message of the- Yeah, yeah. And, and he went on his mission and, you know, he's, he's out rolling. He's like, and then the cop stopped me for nothing. And he said, he's the wrong guy to stop. Right. Now, what made the record scary was people like this guy. That's the scary part. If I made a record- They could empathize. If I made a record called Baby Killer, everyone would hate me right. and I would have been done. 
You follow me? I'm if I make a record called Fireman Killer, right. every fucking body would hate me. Right. But I made a record called Cop Killer and I was a hero. And not only was I a hero, the white kids of America were, I mean, we were doing the shows and they had their fists in the air. It was a protest record. Yeah, exactly. It was the most vile, aggressive form of protest record saying if y'all keep- Non-violent. If y'all- It's music. It was non-violent, it was a way of saying if y'all don't, if y'all keep beating on us, right. this could potentially right. happen. Right, exactly. And me, myself, as a human being, I always felt that we're all men. And just because you have a badge, I'm not going to kneel down and let you beat me. Mm -hmm. At some point, now you've, you've disrespected that badge, and now you're just getting it on with mm -hmm. me. You're doing your thing. That if was you, 19 years ago. And if you took a listen to the record, I preempted the riots. I was letting you know this is This the, is what's gonna come if this shit keeps happening. This is the tone. The atmosphere's there for something like that to happen and well, it happened. What people saw in Rodney King was what we were living with for ten years. Right. It was finally on tape. Finally on tape. Yeah. So, you know, I have nothing against cops whatsoever. I mean I played a cop in New Jack City, I play a cop on television, you know. But you got to remember, part of my life, that, I was a criminal. Yeah, so you know. So yeah. at that point, they were the opponent. Mm -hmm. I never hated them. Right. They're just the opponent. The other team. They're the other team. Oh, no. Now I'm not. Right. I'm legit, so right. I don't need them to tow my car. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when you have any group doing anything, you're going to have elements in the group that are right. going to be bad. Right. And I think when we, the show we're on, you know, when I started to do Law & Order, Dick Wolf approached me, they talked to me about this stuff, and they said, well, you're not that fond of cops. I said, well, not, not all of them, but, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't hate them. He says, what you admit, we need them. I'm like, definitely. Of course. He said, well, play the cop we need. We're dealing with child molesters and rapists, which they don't even like in prison. Right. So the cats we're busting, we're not busting guys for smoking a joint. Right. We're busting cats that Thank really God need. Thank God I'd be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> you rested me. <laughs> And also, you're producing a couple of um, documentaries. One mm -hmm. I uh, saw part of, which I thought was amazing, about rap, mm -hmm. the art of rap. What did you find about the different rappers that you spoke to? You know what it is, Belzer? It's, it's not that I found out the anything. It's like I knew it, and I wanted to let other people ah. see it. I knew that all these guys have a reason for the music they write. I knew that all these guys have deeper... Uh, sentiments other than what kind of car they're driving or what girl they're with mm -hmm. or how much jewelry they got. We just never ask those questions when we do interviews. You know, they always ask us dumb questions, right. you know. So I went in and I, I wanted to make a show that intellectuals would enjoy. People could get a good understanding of where the music comes from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we did a good, good job. It's so educational, but it's also fascinating and, you know, it, because you're talking to some people in the street, you're talking to some people in the studio, you're mm -hmm. talking to some people that invented aspects of the form, mm -hmm. and you're talking to young guys and guys, a couple of guys that you know that I never heard of that were like conspiracy rap. A mortal technique yeah, you I liked. Mean, I, that cat blew my mind. <laughs> I mean, he, I mean, he's very highly uh, informed mm -hmm. in his knowledge, and then in, in incorporating rap about, you know, government conspiracies and oil and, you know, the You know dollar. what it is, Bells? I don't think, you know... That was fascinating. Since hip-hop came from the streets, I don't really think it's looked at as art. I think it's just something that them, you know, poor kids can do. Yeah, that's why I think your film is important. And also, another film that you produced and narrate... Planet Rock. Planet Rock, which is about crack, cocaine, mm -hmm. and hip-hop music. How it intersects. The constellation of those things intersect and what the cultural impact of the music and the drug which uh, everybody kind of knows about but y you really kind of focused on it and th the thing that blows my mind is uh, the degree to which our government was involved in allowing certain neighborhoods to get crack mm -hmm. and you know it was an industry and, and also, a lot of people made money off it and also the way that the time you get is a hundred to one if you're white and you did part of cocaine, mm -hmm. you know, slap on a wrist. If you're right. black and you got crack, you ain't coming back. For an ounce of cocaine and an ounce of crack, sentencing is 100 to 1. But it's just one is more directed toward poor people. But the one thing I can say about my form is that we never made crack seem good. Right. 
you know, crack is whack, Keith Haring, all of us were mm -hmm. out to shut it down. Right. Public Enemy, myself, uh, Brand Nubians, we had records that said, don't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, don't do it, leave this alone. You know, you don't hear that. I'm talking about, you know, the mainstream, so-called mainstream it's, corporate press. It's just like if you go down to Occupy Wall Street right now, they'll only interview the most insane, yeah. crazy people. And the most eloquent ones get cut out of the... No, yeah. they don't, they don't, they see them and they don't aim the camera at them. Right. They want to show all the loonies right. and say this is what it's about. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, that's, that's the game, um, unfortunately. You know, try to make us look crazy. Try to so that's why I had to go out as an elder statesman of hip hop and go ahead and do these movies about crack and try to lay it out. So you know, it is a hip hop generation that doesn't have as much prejudice, as much right. you know, this, that, and the third. It's, it's not that old regime, and I believe we did have a lot to do with closing the gap yeah. to allow that to happen.